So good morning or afternoon, depending on where you're calling in from. And welcome to PCLA's Let's Talk Parkinson's series. My name is Laura Kurtenbach. I'll be your moderator for today, and I'm a board member with PCLA. Today we have Dr. Tagliotti, the director of the Movement Disorders Program at Cedars Sinai Medical Center. Mm -hmm. And he will be discussing COVID-19 and Parkinson's and answering all the questions that you have. And then with that, we're gonna go ahead and kick this off. And I'd, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tagliotti out in the ocean, on the beach, the director of the Movement Disorders Program at Cedars Sinai Medical Center. So thank you, Dr. Tagliotti. If we could all clap, I mean, obviously we can't hear it, but thank you so much today for joining us. And I didn't know that if you had any like initial thoughts or things that you wanna review with us before we get into the Q&A. No, thank you. Thank you for inviting me, first of all. Um, hello, everybody from the beach of Santa Monica. Um, I hope that you will find this program uh, uh, informative. I have prepared a bunch of slides, and I hope I can share my screen. Should we try to share my screen? Uh, host disabled my screen sharing. Can I be re-enabled? Oh, no. Dr. Tagli, I'm going to see if I can work on that. Bear mm -hmm. with us. All right. Thanks, everyone, oh, for your patience. Yes, yeah. yeah, so I, ha I have enabled the ability for anyone to share, but it doesn't seem to be taking. I don't know if it's because the meeting has already started. Um, I have a question, Sarah. Laura, uh, uh, Sarah. If I, I went over to him, if I go in and do make him a host or a co-host, will that allow him to share? Probably, uh, yes. Yes. Yeah. yes, that should do it. Yes, make a co-host. Okay, Great. try it now and let's see what happens. Let's see. Yes. Awesome. There you go. I'm so, so happy. Okay, great. Thanks, That's Judy. Awesome. No problem. This is all. That's it. I think that we are in. Perfect. Can you guys see the the slides now? Yes. Can everybody see them? Yes? Yep. Good. Okay. So let's get going. So no good um, lecture on Parkinson's disease can start without a reference to Dr. James Parkinson himself, uh, with, as you might know, 200 years ago in 1817, uh, first described uh, uh, first described the neurological syndrome that now takes his name. But the, the reason why I, I present this is, is more for the date, 1817, forward 100 years, and we get to 1918 when the last uh, pandemic uh, comparable to what we are experiencing today uh, took place, the so-called Spanish flu, although as you might know, uh, nothing to do with Spain, um, hit the world with the with three waves of, uh, of infection, millions of people unfortunately lost their life. But as far as Parkinson's disease is concerned, the Spanish flu brought a tremendous interest in, in Parkinson's disease oh. because uh, as some of you might know, uh, people that survived the Spanish flu, some of them at least, um, develop uh, Parkinson's disease, develop a, 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 an infection of the brain that uh, uh, resulted in symptoms very, very similar to Parkinson's disease. And so uh, the, the medical world uh, started dealing with a lot of people with, with uh, neurological symptoms uh, uh, similar or equal to Parkinson's disease. And a lot of the knowledge that we still have today uh, started 100 years ago with the Spanish flu. And in fact, for example, oh, what happened here? There you go. For example, um, uh, uh, the, the term Lewy bodies that uh, many of you might be familiar with are these uh, this, uh, protein aggregations that are found in the brain of patients with Parkinson's disease was coined 100 years ago by this uh, Russian doctor, Dr. Trechakov, who was studying patients with Parkinson and the Spanish flu. So. So uh, uh, this pandemic, uh, 100 years ago, um, unfortunately, uh, the, contributed to a lot of the knowledge that we started developing for Parkinson's disease. Now, fast forward another 100 years, 
And here we are with uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, which unfortunately I'm sure you're all very familiar with, um, originated in Wuhan, China, disseminated very quickly to reach pretty much the entire globe. And as of yesterday, um, I checked there are over 5 million people affected officially by the disease and in, in, in the United States over one and a half million people affected by the disease. I'm not going to discuss the controversies on many there are really or not, but definitely there are a lot of people affected by this uh, novel coronavirus infection. And let's review, what, what is this coronavirus? We are bombarded by a number of uh, uh, of information and uh, news and fake news. So let's try to to, to set up what we know. The, the information keeps on coming. It's only two or three months that we have been dealing with this, but we know a number of important things. The, the, the coronavirus or novel, novel coronavirus is part of a family of, 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 of viruses that are well known. They're part of the common cold um, uh, viruses. But this one in particular has a number of issues that are particularly dangerous. Uh, and, uh, and, and most importantly, the fact that it has a very high infectivity. It tends to pass quickly from person to person. And as you can see, it, every, uh, uh, every uh, human being that is infected by, with, the, with the novel coronavirus can infect on average at least four other people, as opposed to, for example, the, the regular flu in which people in fact maybe one or two so twice as infective and importantly people can pass the corona the novel coronavirus even when they're not symptomatic so as you all know i'm sure you heard uh on tv that you can spread the disease when you have no symptoms which makes it particularly dangerous because people can go around without any cough without any symptom and spread the disease unknowingly um it is a, a RNA virus, um, uh, which means in, in, in very simple terms that it can change very frequently. He has a 25% recombination rate, meaning that it changes uh, very frequently. And when this virus is changed, can be good and can be bad. It can be good, like the, S, uh, the SARS uh, virus, uh, uh, it, it can fizzle out, it can lose its, uh, its dangerous uh, uh, features, or it can get worse. It can get even more resistant to treatment or resistant to, to vaccination. So hopefully it will change for the better, but this is a very, very typical feature of this coronavirus. It's the RNA uh, uh, viruses that they tend to change uh, uh, very, very frequently. Naturally, they, they don't need to be re recombined with, with particular lab procedures, uh, as I'm sure you might have read here and there, conspiracy theories. These viruses just change uh, naturally on their own. And uh, sorry, there you go. So what does uh, this coronavirus do? Um, it goes in the body and look for a particular receptor that is called angiotensin converting enzyme 2 or ACE2. And these receptors is very, very widely distributed in the body, particularly in the lungs and in the respiratory tract, but also in the arteries and the veins. And we'll see what relevance that might have for, for what the virus does. And so typically, as you can see in this chest X-ray, what happens to people that develop this, uh, this infection is that they may get a pneumonia basically. And uh, the, the, the lungs may be attacked by the virus and damage, uh, uh, fluids may accumulate and basically becomes very difficult to breathe. And uh, the, with the consequent need for hospitalization and uh, mechanical ventilation and, and, and so forth. The symptoms develop pretty quickly. Uh, it's not true that it takes 14 days. It takes about four to five days after exposure, but it may take as long as 14 days. That's why they say that the quarantine should last two weeks right before uh, when you come back from a trip or from, from being possibly exposed. But, uh, but usually the symptoms uh, um, occur uh, on average about four to five days after exposure. And something that has been confused using in the public eye is that the clinical presentation is very similar to the flu. Even though this is not the flu, it looks a little bit like the flu, you know, fatigue, fever, bone pain, muscle pain, 
uh, it looks a little bit like the flu, especially in the mildest uh, presentation, which uh, fortunately is, um, is the majority of the cases. And, but despite looking like the flu, it is not the flu. And in fact, a very high proportion of people require to go to the hospital. In Europe, this has been calculated about 30%. So one of the three people with a proven COVID-19 has to go to the hospital. In, in the States, it seems to be a little bit less. These statistics are difficult to understand because a lot of people stay home anyway because they don't wanna to go to the hospital, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but the bottom line is that a lot of people need to go to the hospital and those who go to the hospital very often need to go to the intensive care unit, which is the entire problem here. The, 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 the burden of this infection on the hospital system, not just in the United States, but everywhere in the world, if you uh, let this um, uh, infection goes uncontrolled, and 5% of the cases have to go to the intensive care unit, we would use all the intensive care unit bed in, in a matter of a couple of weeks. And so that's why the stay at home order and the lockdowns and all these uh, 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 stories that have filled the airwaves over the past uh, couple of months. And it's well known, unfortunately, that age is a most, the most important risk factor. In other ways, um, um, uh, People, the, the older they are, the more at risk they are of, of, of uh, severe complications of, of uh, the infection. And in addition to age, there are predisposing uh, 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 illnesses like hypertension, like uh, atherosclerosis, diabetes, immunosuppression, of course, so people that are under uh, chemotherapy for cancer. Uh, or have other reason for immunosuppression are particularly exposed to the vagaries of this virus. Interestingly, and we'll get back to that, and it's relevant for this audience, Parkinson's disease in and of itself is not a predisposing uh, condition. So having Parkinson's disease in and on itself without hypertension, without um, other uh, diseases is not, does not put you more at risk than someone of your same age, but without Parkinson's disease to developing or uh, uh, having particular consequences after uh, COVID. Um, there you go. Treatment, I'm not gonna spend too much time. Uh, we hear about treatment of COVID every other minute um, for good and bad reasons. Um, the bottom line is that there is no treatment for COVID. There are a lot of experimental trials. So you hear them every day, the antivirals and the infamous hydroxychloroquine, uh, antibodies, plasma, uh, azithromycin. There are a number of very, very good and very smart attempts to treat this virus. But the bottom line is that as of today, we don't have a treatment, we don't have a cure. There are a lot of research on vaccination. The best advice today is not to get it because the treatment is really not there. So let's switch to the brain because um, we are neurologists here. We're not pulmonologists or virologists. So we are interested to see what is this virus doing to the, to the brain, if anything. And the jury is still out. We, we don't have a, 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 a tremendous uh, evidence that this uh, virus is doing uh, uh, too much damage to the brain, at least directly. But experience with previous, with other type of coronavirus, the SARS coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, have taught us that these type of viruses can indeed go to the brain and do damage to the brain. So we're out there, we're on the outlook because uh, uh, there is um, experimental data, again, not relative to the novel coronavirus, but to previous coronaviruses that this uh, uh, virus can go uh, to the nervous system and maybe contribute to some of the complications that we are observing in this virus. And, and um, this is just a, an, an experiment that was done in, uh, in mice uh, showing that if you inject, uh, again, the MERS virus, not the novel coronavirus to the nose, you can find it into the brain after a couple of days. So there is some concern that it might go to the brain because also many people that are found to be infected with the coronavirus reports that they have lost their smell. 
And of course, losing their smell, some of you might be very familiar with this issue, has been uh, described in the early phases of Parkinson's disease and can be secondary to the virus uh, going to this, the centers of smells, uh, of smell in the brain. But at the same time, of course, when you have a respiratory infection, when your nose and is, 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 is affected, like when you have a sinusitis, you can lose their smell as well. So it's still controversial, it's still debated whether you lose your smell after uh, uh, having the COVID infection because you have a severe respiratory uh, tract infection or because the, the virus is kind of creeping up into the brain. And the good news is that um, it, it might not be a problem with the brain because there are no receptors for the virus on the, on, on the, on the of, of, uh, olfactory nerves, on, on the nerves that kind of are there to, to perceive the, the smells in the air. Um, and, and so it, at this stage, we do not believe that the frequent report of uh, uh, loss of smell might be secondary to a, a neurological, to the brain invasion of, of the virus. But it, it is certainly to say, I have to be careful, uh, it is certainly to say, but there are no receptors in the nerves, in the, in the smell nerves. Um, and also, this is an MRI, it's, 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 it's very difficult to say, but uh, to, 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 to see, but this, this bright, little areas here where the two arrows are, are the of, of olfactory bulbs, meaning the, the part of the brain that are in charge of, of picking up the smells. And in people with COVID, at least the one that have been, uh, that have been uh, studied, the olfactory bulb is perfectly fine. It doesn't seem to be inflamed. It doesn't seem to be infected. So again, there is no evidence that the brain might be attacked by the virus. However, people that develop COVID can have a lot of neurological problems because they have very severe infection, very severe pneumonia, very severe problems that can affect the brain. The brain can be an innocent bystander to any severe uh, infection of the body. And in fact, uh, in, uh, in the initial experience in Wuhan in China, uh, uh, almost 50% of patients with severe COVID infection ended up having some form of neurological problem, mostly, as you can see, impaired consciousness, which is typical of severe infection. If you have a high fever, if you cannot breathe, uh, it's, it's, it's not uncommon to have uh, uh, some uh, difficulty with your, with your mental capacities. But also, uh, uh, and this is something particularly worrisome, and I'll get back to that briefly, uh, uh, some people have strokes, and that is more difficult to explain, but, but there is a possible explanation, which is due to the fact that, as I said before, the virus can go after our arteries and our, after our uh, veins and cause increased coagulations and therefore strokes. Fortunately, this is the minority of cases. You see only 5%, not that many, but still uh, it, it's one of those things that, um, that is pretty scary about this virus. What about Parkinson's disease? The good news, let me start with that, is that, and I was on a, on a, a big uh, international conference call earlier this morning, that does not seem to be a particularly severe effect of COVID specifically on Parkinson's disease. So in other words, we don't have, and I'm in contact with the colleagues literally around the world, there does not seem to be um, any increase in uh, uh, severity of Parkinson or even a, a, a particularly high um, uh, rate of infection with COVID-19 in patients with Parkinson's disease. Actually, I have to say that uh, I am not aware among my patients, I, I didn't call them one by one, but I'm not aware of any patient with Parkinson's disease in my practice that has uh, being infected with COVID. However, there are some experiences from Europe. Um, this is a paper by Dr. Antonini. You know, Italy has been very uh, hard hit by, by coronavirus and Dr. Chaudhry in, uh, in London. And they have reported 10 patients. Now, 
just think about it, right? We're talking about hundreds of thousands of infection and they, all they report is 10 patients. Now, 10 too many, we all agree on that, but not that many. Um, and, and these are big specialists that see hundreds and hundreds of patients. And so all they found was 10 patients, as you can see, uh, uh, pretty ahead, not only in age, but also in the severity of disease. And unfortunately, in these 10 patients, the, 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 the disease was quite severe and four out of 10, unfortunately, lost their life. But again, we're talking about 10 people, which in my mind is, uh, is a very small number of people, uh, uh, if you count the hundreds of thousands of, of, of infections in Northern Italy and in England. Another interesting paper that has been uh, published literally, literally a few days ago comes from France and two patients, again, we're talking about very small number, very, very limited experience, but a little bit more interesting in the fact that these two patients, when they developed the COVID infection, initially, all they developed was a worsening of their Parkinson's. So the doctors initially, they didn't really think about uh, COVID at all because they, these people didn't have a pneumonia, didn't have a cough, didn't have a respiratory problems, but they seem to have a worsening of their Parkinson's. And only several days later, when they started having more severe symptoms and had to go to the hospital, they were tested and they were found to be uh, COVID positive. And unfortunately, uh, things didn't do well for them and they lost their life. Again, two patients, and but uh, something that raised some attention in the Parkinson community because basically told us, you know, if someone has an unexpected worsening of their Parkinson and that you, you believe that they might be exposed to, to people infected with COVID, think COVID sooner rather than later. Rare, again, rare, but possible. So, does Parkinson's disease increase risk of COVID? And the answer as of today, May 22nd is no. We do not have any uh, indication that having Parkinson's disease is a predisposing condition or a, or a uh, pre-existing condition, as we like uh, to say, of having COVID or having worse COVID or having more advanced consequence from COVID. We have experience in Northern Italy, as I said, I don't know anybody. Today I was uh, on, on this conference call, Dr. Fasano from uh, Canada. He has a large uh, uh, experience uh, with these patients in, in Toronto and he, he didn't report virtually any infection uh, of a patient with Parkinson. So good news in that respect, which doesn't, doesn't tell us that we have to lower the guard by any means, but at least it's, this is not something like hypertension, diabetes, or, 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 or uh, pulmonary problems that put people at higher risk of severe consequences. And in reality, there is no reason for that because Parkinson's disease does not make your immune system worse or, or more susceptible of, of developing infections. And uh, the pulmonary function in patients with Parkinson's disease, there are a few papers saying that maybe uh, it might be mildly reduced because of the reduced mobility of the respiratory muscles. But, but really there is no reason to believe that the pulmonary function and immune uh, system are dramatically reduced uh, so that uh, uh, people with uh, Parkinson's disease might experience worse complication of COVID infection. Um, oh, very good. One interesting uh, detail is that some of the medication that are taken for Parkinson's disease, and in particular amantadine, might actually be protective. Um, the, the, the data is, is very sparse. Um, there are only five patients, and, and, I, and I want to make sure that we understand that this is very, very early preliminary information. I don't want anybody to go out there and ask their doctor to give them amantadine or hydroxychloroquine for that matter. But, uh, but these five patients reported by these two doctors um, um, a few days ago with COVID-19, so these are patients with Parkinson that did develop COVID-19, they were taking levodopa and amantadine, and for some reason, maybe to the amantadine, which as you know is an antiviral, 
or maybe not, they did not develop severe consequences and they did not die of, of COVID-19. And so this doctor put this information out there saying, hey, uh, check this out because the amantadine might have some good effect, at least on our population of patients with Parkinson's disease. But again, five cases. So we have to be very careful when we have these little numbers. Um, another very interesting piece of information that was confirmed today in our um, in our uh, conference by by my uh, friend Dr. Fasano in Canada is that vitamin D might actually have an interesting protective factor, and he noticed that too also in his patients. Um, in general, vitamin D tends to be a little deficient with age and with Parkinson in in particular. And so this is something that we may pay attention to, make sure that we have adequate supplementation and make sure that we are not deficient in vitamin D. Preliminary data, uh, nothing that I will go immediately out of the door and get vitamin D supplementation, but there is interesting data suggesting that vitamin D could be protective for COVID-19 uh, in general and for patients with Parkinson that, you know, are at risk, like all of us, to, to develop this infection. So vitamin D uh, uh, is something interesting that uh, keep your antennas up for more information about that. So different than the, the Spanish flu, we really have no information at this point that uh, COVID-19 might cause a wave of more Parkinson or, or make Parkinson worse, um, other than those two cases that I showed you earlier. But of course, Parkinson's disease is a disease of aging. I mean, it is, of course, increasingly more common after age 60. And so by association, if COVID-19 is more dangerous in, in the elderly, it will be more dangerous in, in people with Parkinson, whether they par because just because of the age. And also because the restrictions that have been necessary uh, to uh, contain, to, to mitigate, the effects of the, of the infection as public health measures have reduced, unfortunately, a, a number of uh, uh, important uh, uh, issues uh, uh, for Parkinson patients, uh, like physical activity, like access to outpatient care that uh, may, in, in many cases, uh, contribute in, indirectly, right? Not directly as an infection or disease, but indirectly as a consequence to uh, the adjustment, uh, the restriction that we all have been going through in the last two, three months to a deterioration of Parkinson's disease, both at the inpatient and outpatient level. And we're gonna review some of them together because some of them may be uh, relevant and, and interesting to, to know. So in terms of hospital care, interestingly enough, uh, patients with Parkinson's disease that are admitted for pneumonia, not COVID pneumonia, just pneumonia in general, tend to actually do better than their age-matched uh, uh, people without uh, Parkinson's disease. They tend to stay in the hospital a bit longer, but they have less mortality. So they do better, basically, which is a good news, uh, although it's one of those things that I wouldn't want to test the hypothesis, so to speak. Um, but uh, but definitely patients with Parkinson are not supposed to do worse than anybody else of their own age uh, just because they're hospitalized. However, once a patient with Parkinson in the hospital, because of the nature of the medications that they take and the nature of their disease, they are at risk of a number of problems, a delirium, drug reactions, um, uh, problems with swallowing, problems with falling, that we need to pay extra attention to. So it's never a good idea for a patient with Parkinson, unless of course it's a necessity to go to the hospital without a good reason. Because once in the hospital, uh, there are a number of intrinsic risks that uh, need to be, uh, uh, we need to pay a lot of attention to. So it's important uh, uh, to reduce the risk to show up in the hospital for any patient with Parkinson with or without COVID crisis uh, around. Once in a hospital, we know that patients with COVID tend to go to the ICU. They, they need intubation. And, uh, and what happens for when patients with Parkinson need to go to the ICU is that they have a, if you have to put a tube, you can't swallow the pills. 
So there are a number of other issues. Uh, you need to, to put the medication you know, through uh, the, the tubes. It's, it's, it gets complicated. And if the ICU is, is not experienced in taking care of Parkinson's disease, people may not be treated at all. They may forget about the levodopa because you know, they, 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 they don't think it's, it's immediately important. So these are all issues that fortunately, I repeat, we do not have. I have not been called once to take care of a Parkinson patients with COVID in the ICU. But if that would happen, we know what we need to do. We need to use NG tube or injections or patches, all ways to, to bypass the need to swallow the pills. Of course, if you have a tube, a respiratory tube, you could not be able to do. So all issues that doctors that follow Parkinson's disease are very, very aware of. But let's not talk about, you know, acute or severe crisis. Let's talk about in general what happens, uh, what is actually happening to, to, to the world. The, the world is under stress. We are limited in our movements. We are limited in what we can do. We, 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 we're, we're scared to, 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 rightly so, to share, to shake hands with, uh, with people, whether we know them or not. And so there's an increased level of stress, and we all know that stress is not good for Parkinson. Uh, stress can uh, cause a, a worsening of motor symptoms. Uh, uh, it's not clear whether it can cause a, a, a aggravation of the disease on the long term, but definitely in the short term is not something good to have. And uh, it's, it's more difficult for patients with Parkinson to deal with stress. They feel it heavier, basically. And uh, most importantly, whether they can deal with stress or not, the fact that they cannot, that the gyms are closed, that the rehab facility, that, that, that your, your physical therapist cannot uh, follow you, it's a major uh, uh, drawback. And I know that there are a lot of online um, uh, online programs out there that are that have been helping a lot of our patients, but definitely uh, the the inability to go see your pa your doctor, the inability to go to do your physical therapy, can definitely at least for the time being, hopefully, going to reopen carefully a little bit. But it's it's something that we all pay a lot of attention because it can cause um, um, uh, at least short term temporary. A worsening of the symptoms. Um, another general impact is anxiety. This, uh, this is a, a interesting study from Iran, um, and they found that, uh, as you can see, a uh, patient with the Parkinson disease seems to have more anxiety due to the, uh, to the COVID crisis compared to people that don't have Parkinson's disease. And of course, anxiety is not good to have in general, and it's not good to have for Parkinson's disease because it may make the tremors worse, it may make the, the symptoms worse. And uh, interestingly, also the caregivers, so the spouses, the families, the friends that take care of patients with Parkinson seems to have more anxiety that, uh, because of the situation. So this is something that we as physicians are very aware of, and that's why we have implemented, as we'll see, all sort of... Uh, uh, possible remedies, including telemedicine, in order to keep touch, to keep in touch, and to and to be able to counsel our patients. And here is goes the telemedicine. The the small, trust me, I I I, I don't know if I would like to to trade off uh, what we are learning with telemedicine with the entire crisis. But the the small silver lining of all this situation has been the tremendous. Uh, advances and development in telemedicine that we have been forced in a way to uh, adopt. Um, telemedicine for Parkinson's disease has been touted for years now. Um, it's, it's something that we have been advocating for years. I'm sure that some of you have been going to, to meetings and debates about telemedicine, especially for people that live far away from uh, you know, main uh, clinical centers, uh, specialists, uh, um, but the advent of, of the COVID crisis has uh, uh, created a, a, literally an explosion of the use of telemedicine, a relaxation of all the restrictions, all the regulations that Medicare, Medicaid, all the insurance had put on the use of telemedicine. And in, over the past two months, we have been using telemedicine more than we ever had and we are uh, uh, developing a lot of experience and we have been able to help a lot of people 
that otherwise would have been uh, impossible to, to, to reach out to. So the interesting thing of telemedicine is that we can even examine people with some exceptions, but we can look at tremors, we can look at mobility, we can look at walking, we can look at balance, we can definitely talk and, and, and listen, we can change medication. So it's something that had uh, very, very um, positively um, um, helped uh, our community of Parkinson specialists to help uh, the community of, of patients. Uh, there are um, there are a lot of studies on telemedicine, as I said. Uh, we, this is nothing that was created two months ago. So there are uh, uh, the four C of telemedicine: improve access to care, convenience, comfort, confidentiality. And now we have the fifth C, which is COVID contagion. And the COVID has definitely uh, contributed, as I said, to a greater uh, increase in use all over the world. I've been in touch with many colleagues throughout the United States, and we all have now 80, 90% of our visits as video visits or, 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 or telemedicine type of visits. So uh, again, the good news is that uh, uh, the, the insurance world has not been an obstacle, so we can do it. Um, and, 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 and the hospitals, the doctors are reimbursed properly so they can continue to provide care until hopefully this situation will be uh, resolved. And this is just, uh, this is more for my colleagues. Uh, these are uh, guidelines. The American Academy of Neurology and the Movement Disorder Societies have published guidelines to, to set up an, uh, a telemedicine uh, uh, practices um, in, uh, in, for Parkinson's disease. Um, for those who have advanced therapies that might be concerned, uh, people that might have uh, levodopa intestinal gel or deep brain stimulation, they might be more concerned because may say, wait a second, I, I have device. I mean, how, how can I, uh, if I have a problem, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not confident to come to the hospital. Well, even for them, telemedicine can offer, at least in, uh, in, in first uh, instance, a, a, a solution because, um, uh, device problems or, 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 or tubing problems can be shown to the doctor, right, over the video. And so the doctors can triage whether this can be dealt with without uh, taking a, a trip to the hospital um, or it, it requires uh, a, a, a direct examination or maybe an admission to, to change the device or to change uh, the, the advanced therapy. And this is particularly true for deep brain stimulation, because deep brain stimulation, as many of you might know, requires surgery, first of all, you know, you need to implant the, the electrode and then requires a number of visits to set up the, um, uh, the um, uh, programming. And so um, the programming uh, can be delayed, cannot be delayed. It, this is something that we need uh, to decide uh, uh, and, to, and to determine uh, case by case. So we classify the visits as elective that can be deferred or urgent that needs the patients to come in. And in fact, here at Cedar sinai we have offered um, uh, deep brain stimulation reviews since March. We never closed, really. We didn't have too many people that had to come, fortunately, but uh, we were always available to review the deep brain stimulation or the Botox uh, uh, injections. And... Um, so implantation can be, can be um, uh, delayed, uh, um, uh, but you know, if someone has a routine uh, 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 replacement of their DBS battery, that we can wait on, but some people cannot wait. And in fact, we have uh, um, a device, a, a table of the, of the serious cases versus less serious cases. Uh, you see these algorithms. We, didn't, we don't need to go through, uh, through all of them in, in, in detail, but basically there are uh, criteria that we have developed to uh, decide whether someone needs to come to the hospital or not, whether they have uh, a severe risk right, of, of, of uh, exacerbation, maybe a rebound, maybe something severe dyskinesias that we don't want to happen. So we bring them into the hospital to change the battery or to, or to do adjustment of their DBS, or if the, the, the risk 
um, um, may be uh, more contained, may be compensated with changing the medications. And so we don't need to expose our patient to the possible risk uh, of being exposed to COVID coming to the hospital. Um, the outpatient programming is same thing. Uh, we have, uh, um, as I said, uh, offered uh, programming, but most of the routine uh, uh, stimulation programming or adjustment can be uh, safely postponed uh, until uh, safer times. And uh, unless there are severe cases like dyskinesia, as I said, or severe freezing of gait or, or severe side effects of the simulation for whatever reason that we can address on the spot. A few words very quickly about research. Um, uh, research has uh, uh, taken a little bit of a hit um, uh, during this period for a number of reasons, in part because uh, the, the, the research on COVID itself in, in many uh, teaching hospitals has taken over. Um, a, a lot of resources, uh, IRB and uh, attention has been devoted to research uh, COVID itself. Um, but, um, but we have been continuing to offer at least the people that were already enrolled in research the ability to come for follow-up and to come for safety visits. And uh, as recent as last week, we has started reopening some of our recruitment. And so the, the research for, for new treatment and new solution for Parkinson's disease has not stopped and is going to continue, um, at least in our mind and in our action, is going to continue on, uh, without uh, slowing. There are 10 uh, clinical trials that are uh, on the sideline now here at Cedar sinai and we hope to, to get going as soon as possible. And we don't need to go through all these details, but these are the best practice recommendations that we have issued here at Cedar sinai We, of course, uh, uh, promote and recommend all measures of social distancing um, uh, currently in place. So we, of course, we recommend to follow the guidelines that are issued by the government and by uh, our mayor and governors. Um, we should definitely pay a lot of attention, especially if we are older than 60, especially if we have Parkinson's disease. And so we recommend to avoid or postpone inpatient hospital stay for non- urgent uh, causes or also for non-urgent uh, outpatients visits. At the same time, uh, if uh, the problems include uh, a, a checking deep brain simulation program or battery failure or duopa pump or, or Botox injection that would otherwise jeopardize the, the, the well-being, the day-to-day well-being of our patients, we are open for business. We have specific protocols in place um, to uh, prevent unnecessary exposure uh, to our patients. Everybody wears a mask. Um, uh, temperatures are checked on the way in um, our, our place. So we try to really minimize, and I have to say that uh, at least over the past three months, we have not had that we know one single case of one of our patients that needed to come here for whatever reason and turn out to, to be infected. So, so far, so good. So, COVID pandemic rapidly changing. I will live for sure and practice medicine. We are not sure whether the COVID affect the, the, the brain directly, but definitely indirectly is causing a lot of uh, issues uh, um, that uh, affect particularly patients with Parkinson's disease due to decreased mobility, decreased uh, access to exercise, and decreased access to their doctors, to their, to their routine uh, care. Um, uh, the good news, in, in part, is that uh, uh, this has uh, uh, promoted uh, the use of telemedicine. So we have been trying to compensate for this limitation, reaching out to our patients, to their houses. And uh, so far, this has been uh, a, a pretty good solution, which I think will also develop in the future uh, uh, for pretty good solutions uh, in general, even without the limitation uh, of the pandemic. So hopefully, in retrospect, this will be um, remembered as a, a time of progress, a time of evolution. Um, I hope that um, um, this uh, information has been helpful. I want to take a chance to thank my colleagues uh, in the ICU, 
um, that have been uh, keeping us safe. Um, these are uh, our, this is our stroke team and the ICU team. Uh, they uh, they're on the front line every day uh, to keep us safe. I I want to uh, uh, extend an, a virtual round of applause to all uh, my colleagues. Thank you for your attention. Um, I have uh, ten minutes. Uh, if we want to, um, if there are any questions, I'll be more than glad to to answer all of them. Thank you. Dr. Tagliati, this is Laura. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's definitely very informative. I learned a lot. I have a feeling that a lot of us on this call have learned from this presentation about PD and COVID-19. We do have some questions that came through our chat functionality on Zoom. So we do have about 10 minutes. So we're going to focus on a couple questions that I've pulled. There are a couple questions in relation to the heightened anxiety you know, family members ending up in the hospital and not being able to see them. Uh, Benny also was curious about, are there any, anything that they can do to help with the anxiety while they're in the safer at home when it comes to like heightened anxiety? Um, that's a great question. And uh, of course, short of, uh, of uh, you know, uh, the, the, the knee jerk reflex of the anxiolytic, right? Uh, meaning taking medication for anxiety, Definitely um, uh, trying to to engage in, uh, in, uh, in in positive activities like I mentioned online exercise or when possible we are somewhat somewhat uh, blessed in, in 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 Los Angeles Southern California um, because there is access to outdoor spaces and if that is possible and is safe and does not involve uh, 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 crowding or, or, or excessive contacts with the with the use of a of a protective mask. Um, I think that uh, you know uh, routine uh, uh, daily uh, uh, walk uh, outdoor and, and exercise. It is well known that exercise is the best antidepressant uh, um, in the world. And so I would I would encourage maybe having uh, uh, online Zoom. Uh, um, um, you know, chat with 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 families and friends. Uh, um, in other words, try not to watch a TV uh, and 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 hear how bad the world is doing every day. But try to to uh, 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 rely on on our friends, on our family. We are on the same boat, unfortunately, but we can also uh, uh, take care of each other. So exercise as much as uh, safe and possible, and and rely on on your family and friends. Uh, uh, not to only think about uh, how many people have died or how many people have been infected over the past three days. Yeah, uh, we also have a question from Lisa. Uh, she asks, is orthostatic hypertension consider considered an underlying condition for COVID? Good question. Uh, orthostatic hypotension is a, is a, is a, is a, is a very um, uh, uh, common to some degree problem with Parkinson's disease, not always is symptomatic, meaning not always it causes uh, symptoms of dizziness, of lightheadedness, um, but uh, it, it, the predisposing condition for, for COVID includes hypertension, so high blood pressure. Mm -hmm. Orthostatic hypertension is low blood pressure, and so it is. it can be very, very uh, annoying because feeling dizzy every time you stand up is nothing to, to, uh, to desire, but it's not considered per se a, a predisposing factor or risk factor for, um, uh, for severe uh, uh, complication of COVID. Great. I have a question from Robert, and he was curious if there are any risk in high doses of vitamin D, 5,000 IU of vitamin D. So again, um, every, every good thing in, 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 in too high of a dose can become a bad thing. So um, as I mentioned before, there is reason to believe that proper, proper supplementation of vitamin D uh, might be helpful. Now, mind you, might be helpful if you get COVID. So the first line of defense is not to get COVID, okay? The first line of defense is to follow the recommendations, social distancing, and, uh, and avoid to get COVID. Then uh, there is evidence to, uh, and, and, and reason to believe that having uh, avoiding a vitamin D deficiency, which doesn't mean to overload the system with vitamin D, it means to make sure that we don't have low levels of vitamin D, 
um, might be protective, might be protective toward infections, including COVID. And if you get COVID, disgracefully, it might protect from more severe complication of the disease. Now, as you might all know, the best way to develop, to, to synthesize vitamin D is take a walk in the sun. And we are blessed in Los Angeles to have 300 plus days of sun a year. So that's the best way. But uh, we can have, uh, you know, a level, vitamin D level uh, checked. And if they happen to be low, that might be the case with age, uh, then this, the supplementation would be appropriate. But I wouldn't go out there and just load the vitamin D. I would speak with your, with your doctor and check whether your vitamin D is low. And if it is low, then yes, take supplementation. Uh, and I have a question from Karen uh, at, um, in relation to telemedicine. So how do you get seen on telemedicine? There are no doctors within 250 or more miles of me. Oh, that's, that's actually one more good reason to be seen on telemedicine. Right. That should be a solution that should outlast the, the COVID pandemic. And that's what I was uh, mentioning before in terms of, uh, uh, of the silver lining. This is something that we have advocated for years and um, and hopefully this will be a good spur so uh, the the telemedicine can be uh, can be uh, organized with uh, with any uh, centers we are one of those but uh, but I know many uh, uh, good Parkinson specialists that offer telemedicine um, you most of the time you don't need particular technology uh, an iPhone or or you know an iPad is it's enough um, depending on who's your doctor and what system they use, we have our Cedar CS Link uh, video, but we can use uh, the FaceTime, we can use Skype. I mean, there are, there are some limitations due to privacy and due to, to some um, sort of legal uh, uh, limitation, but uh, it, it's, it's pretty doable, it's pretty simple. You don't need to have super advanced technology uh, to uh, to uh, be able to take advantage of, of, of telemedicine. I would uh, uh, consult with, uh, I don't know who's your doctor. You're welcome to to call our system here, Cedar Sinai. We will see you through uh, telemedicine at the first available opportunity. That's great. Um, and then our last question and, and I wanted to toss to the audience and, and get someone to verbally ask their question because I know typing is hard for some people. So if there's someone out there who wants to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask the question and say your name. Is there anyone? No, I just, all right. I have a question. Go ahead. Oh, I was just curious if you've had pneumonia um, and you have Parkinson's, if there's an increased risk to health for COVID, if you get COVID-19? It's kind of obvious, but I just wanted to. Very, very good question, very good question. Um, the, the answer is, is usually no. I mean, unless the pneumonia was somewhat uh, associated with the pre-existing uh, uh, vulnerability or immune deficiency, Usually the pneumonia that we see in the Parkinson world are due to, to what we call aspiration pneumonia, to poor swallowing. But that per se, it does not make you more vulnerable to, to COVID. What makes you vulnerable to COVID usually is deficiency in the immune system, which comes with age, or uh, problems with the vascular system, so high blood pressure um, and, uh, and uh, uh, problems with the respiratory system, asthma, uh, pulmonary, chronic pulmonary obstructive disease for smokers and things like that. Usually Parkinson patients are not smokers and so that usually is not an issue for them. I have to apologize because I have, have, another, <laughs> I have another support group that I need to log in, but Bridget here wants me to tell you that we have started our, our newly diagnosed uh, uh, Parkinson support group. Uh, we'll start uh, online on the Zoom meeting on June 1st at 6.30. So if, you have, if you're interested or if you have uh, friends or people you know that have been uh, diagnosed within the last three years, please contact Bridget Frommelt at, at Cedars because we wanna start offering some support for them online. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Tagliati. We really thank you so much for joining us today and the great information. And for everybody else, we'd like to thank our sponsors for making this possible. 
Boston Scientific, US World Meds, and Linda and Stuart Resnick. This is a great session today, and we'll be having future Let's Talk Parkinson's series in the future. So keep your eyes peeled for an email or a social post. You can always visit our website at pcla.org to get information on all of our upcoming events and webinar series. So thank you all once again for joining us. Uh, we're glad to see at least over 70 people joined us today from across the country.